All right, we're going to go on to something that's not already talked about. Martin Delaney, a person that's already talked about black history, Martin Delaney, two black nationalists. In the mid-19th century, militant abolitionist Martin Delaney, 1812 to 1885, was born in Freetown, Charlestown, which is now West Virginia. He was not only a well-known activist, physician, novelist, journalist, African explorer, and politician, but more importantly for our purposes, he was regarded as a father of black nationalist theory. The ancestral application of this is quite appropriate, for it's not only the core tenet of every black nationalist thought prefiguring his writing like Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X after him. Delaney was a central spokesman, a charismatic leader, and principal chief architect of the movement of black people to establish a separate nation state. 1852, Delaney published his first book, Linked to Defense of the African American Immigration Away from the United States, urging blacks to act collectively to form an independent republic. This inferential work called The Conditions, Elevation, Immigration, and the Destiny of Colored People of the United States strongly encouraged free and fugitive blacks to leave the United States in order to avoid oppression and to build a sovereign nation state that would enable blacks to live under conditions of equality and liberty. The book was written in the wake of the draconian fugitive slave laws, a component of the notorious 1850 Compromise, which enabled slaveholders to pursue runaway slaves even in non-slave-holding territories in which the effect made free blacks even more vulnerable to being enslaved. As they had no reliable legal recourse, since so some slaveholder falsely accused them as fugitive property. This white supremacist tactic caused the budding of a mass movement of black immigration to grow and be energized. In the condition, Delaney famously described blacks in the United States as a pro nation within a nation. These subjugated internal nations are, he claims, unjustly deprived of social and political equality by the ruling classes, but are subject to the most naked and brutal exploitation, and they are often restricted in the most devalued positions within the society in which we live. Furthermore, in order to legitimize the dominant status, the ruling elite guards these subordinate nations as an inherent inferior and incapable of self-government. Now, it is clear why Delaney would regard blacks in the United States as a severely oppressed people, perhaps even a stigmatized caste. However, it's less obvious and somewhat puzzling why we would choose to characterize them as a nation. Moving beyond the pilth and the, and the, and the influence of slogan, I want to clarify Delaney's conception of a black nationality and its program for nation building. I would do so discussing two black nationalist doctrines that are advanced by in Delaney's writings. The first one, strong black nationalism, the political program of black solidarity and voluntary separation under the conditions of equality and self-determination is worthwhile in itself, a constitution of enduring opponent of the collective realization of blacks as a people. The second Weak nationalism, a program of black solidarity and a group of self-organization is a strategy for creating greater freedom or social equality for blacks. The two doctrines are not incompatible, since one might value black political solidarity as a both a means and an ends. And of course, many black nationalists hold this two-pronged view. But it's important to see that these two positions, if taken separately, will have different practical implications. Strong black nationalism treats the establishment of an independent black republic or a, self or a separate self-determining community as an essential goal of black liberation struggles. It advocates the development of a national identity, black self-reliance, and separatism, not only as a means of racial justice, but as a political destiny of African Americans and perhaps of those of African descent. Weak nationalism, on the other hand, urges black solidarity in a concerted effort as a political strategy to uplift or resist oppression. This can mean forming a self-governing black nation state or a separate self-determining community within a multinational state. But it also can mean working to create a racially integrated society or even a post-racial polity, i.e. a political order where race has no social meaning. We might call it a strong black nationalist position, classic nationalism. And let us call anyone who views black political solidarity as a constituent mean to bring about social justice and pragmatic nationalists. The social comment of the pragmatic nationalists based on the desire to live in a free, just society that does not need or be self-contained by a self-determining black community. Notice the program of black immigration from the United States is consistent with forms of nationalism. On a classical view, immigration to build a black republic would seem desirable itself, i.e. apart from the desire to escape the suffering caused by injustice. Well, pragmatic immigration 
would treat it as a mere claim to fight or to avoid oppression, a strategy that could be discarded as another, as one appeared promising. Given these distinctions, my primary contention is Delaney facilitated between perhaps even confused classical nationalism and pragmatic nationalism, and this tendency is characterized by the black nationalist tradition in, in general. While I will here focus my discussion on Delaney's nationalism, my general process is this. Classical nationalism is merely a defense in a rhetoric posture taken up by proponents and a group he takes himself to represent. It is not merely a scene as reacting to white dominance, but asserting equal rights for black as a collective and a self-determination alongside would-be nation. Pragmatic nationalism, on the other hand, is more consistent, definitively in firm held position of many self-styled black nationalism, despite the fact that occasionally evidence from the classical form. In support of this diagnosis, I would demonstrate that the Delaney exemplifies a wavering and tendency. My strategy will be to construe, reconstruct the arguments he offer in favor of each of the two doctrines and show that, contrary to the standard interpretation, he most deeply committed to pragmatic nationalism, notwithstanding his occasional lapse in a discourse of classical nationalism. But before proceeding to that account, let me briefly address the following concern. Some might think that pragmatic nationalism, as here defined, is not sprinkling in the form of nationalism at all, since this form of black politics isn't necessarily tied to the claims of territorial sovereignty or self-government, as many perhaps are, or most nationalists are. As Eddie Gaughan has said convincingly and shown, however the meaning of the language of a nation in the early 19th century, black political thought was intensely congested, as it still is today, with several black, prominent black leaders advocating what I'm here calling pragmatic conception of black nationhood. Delaney, the widely acknowledged progenitor of the black nationalist theory, was among those struggling to define the concept of the black nationality that could be used for emancipatory purposes. And his nationalism, I would demonstrate, sometimes fell short of the demands of black sovereignty. Accordingly, I maintain the idiom of black nationhood is deployed to define a people to a collective and to the collective interest in a will and create bonds of political solidarity among those in a will-be community. The label of nationalism is appropriate, even if the political goal was not necessary the creation of a separate, self-determined corporate unit. One way to get a handle on what's really drive Delaney's black nationalists is to examine the morals and the political views which he defends or assumes in the course of developing his national program. There are four core principles in this grid of his political philosophy. Social equality, democratic citizenship, self-government, and manly virtues. Like many liberals, Delaney believed that, a, that the justice, matter of justice, and all members of society should adopt equal respect within social, political, and economic life, and that every citizen should possess the same basic rights and duties. He also maintained, however, that blacks have not received true social equality with whites unless blacks, more or less, match them in cultural and economic achievement. As the accomplishment engenders the respect of others and self-respect, thus only appropriate blacks and white attainment in essential fears of life could in the two races truly live together in terms of mutual respect. Delaney also believed that blacks must have a democratic citizenship within their country. The right to the citizen should not only include the equal protection of the laws, but the right to enjoy and honor public trust. Citizenship then is not merely a matter of having the right to vote for members of the dominant group, but also the possession of a requisite of merit, having fair opportunity to occupy the positions of authority within a country which Perm 1 permanently resides. Closely related to the principles of democratic citizenship is the right of self-government. Delaney maintains that true freedom requires, true political freedom requires each adult form an indispensable part of the sovereign authority of the republic. A people must be free and it must be necessary to be their own rulers and to each individual must be himself, embodying an essential agreement, so to speak, of a sovereign principle which comes to the true basis of liberty. This principle is not exercised by himself at his pleasure, but be delegated to another, his true representative. Delaney also argues that a self-government is necessary for self-defense, since one cannot be secure in one life, welfare, or liberty without equal and effective matters of public concern. In addition to these liberal principles, Delaney values the moral virtue and one might call that of manhood. Despite the unfortunate term manhood as Delaney understand it, it's a quality of character that is not particular to men as women of value who embodied it. No doubt, Delaney was not using manhood as purely a gender-neutral way I am not suggesting that he did not embrace the many traditional patriotic values, i.e. the belief of a convenient domestic sexual division of labor and a practical education of women equipped them for child rearing. 
He certainly did not hold such views and, of course, denied the time. But he also was important to recognize that despite these typical excuses and sexist prejudice, Delaney clearly wanted women to cultivate this manly character through perhaps not the same extent or quite the same way as men. Bigger will perhaps be more appropriate and less masculine the term to use the relevant and simple traits. The most important of these qualities is autonomous thinking. Delaney is particularly dismayed when blacks allow whites, even sympathetic to black interests, to think for them. And thus, he consistently urged the blacks to resist white paternalism. He makes this point repeatedly in regards to religion, claiming that blacks have unthinkingly accepted their oppressors' interpretation of Christianity and interpretation that encouraged passivity in the face of insubordination and exploitation. Furthermore, he finds it disgraceful and a sure signs of degradation when blacks lavishly imitate the conduct of their oppressors. Thus, he urged blacks to be creative and imaginative in their individual and collective endeavors. This, of course, requires a degree of self-confidence and faith in one ability. When Delaney believes blacks are thoroughly lacking and must be a considered effort to develop, this confidence and an innovative spirit must be joined with a laudable ambition. According to Delaney, as soon as they're able to acquire a few conveniences of some leisures, blacks often become complacent in their second-class status in American society. But he insists that manhood requires a constant through moderation, striving for a superior achievement in every sense of spirit of life. Courage is among no trace of vigor character and endangers and endears the respect of others, even sometimes the respect of one oppressor. Perhaps more importantly, courage along with independent mind is a sign of self-respect. He values and urges the cultivation of courage that expresses itself in a fight for freedom, equality under the conditions of domination. Culture related to this is the trait of determination and the earnest resolve that it doesn't falter when confronted, confronted with adversity. Finally, vigor involves self-reliance. Danny Delaney holds that any expectant burden of racial oppression to lift up by some other agency, blacks should realize that they must rely solely on themselves as individuals and as a collective in their efforts to rise above their lowest position in U.S. society and within the international community. It is not that he holds black responsibility for a subordinate position. He simply believes that self-respect and prudence suggest that self-help is the surest road, if not to freedom, to at least a dignified existence. Delaney vividly represents the quality mm -hmm. of vigorous characters through the man hero of the movie Blake, of the, his novel Blake or Hudson America, 1859, a fictional slave narrative written by critical response to Harry Beecher Snow depiction of a slave as docile, ignorant, and helpless in our Miss Popularity novel, anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852. The Afro-Cuban Henry Blake is in stark contrast to Cole Stone Skull's character as an intelligent, brave, and visionary runaway slave who organized a slave insurrection throughout the United States and Cuba. British risked his life of freedom to work on the abolition of slavery. There is an important relationship between Delaney's three political principles and the qualities of the vigorous character Delaney believes in part the reason why all blacks often fail to exhibit the traits of vigor, independence of mind, creativity, self-confidence, ambition, courage, self-respect, determination, and self-reliance is that it's severely oppressed. In a particular, they lack social economic equality and a right to democratic citizenship and political self-determination. This kind of self-depravity often weakens the character of many, though not all, who suffer under it. Blacks have been acutely debased over the many years in their bondage. It is also clear that the various persons are the ones who are most likely to struggle and fight for the realization of liberal, liberal, these liberal principles. Over time, segregated persons will become accustomed to and resigned to less than full liberty and equality. Delaney maintains, therefore, that blacks must find a way through group reliance and solidarity to reinvigorate themselves if they should overcome their oppressed condition and thus become the nation they should be. Now, these political principles and moral values can be given to an individual interpretation or a collectivist one. That is, the claim of equality, citizenship, and self-government can be found on the rights of individual persons or peoples, and the vigor is a property that can be possessed by individuals or communities where the manliness of the community is not reduced to the vigorous characters of the individual members. Delaney seemed aware of this distinction, but became somewhat ambiguous mm -hmm. to his nationalism, should it be understood as ultimately rooted in individual or group claims. Furthermore, moreover, it seems that Delaney core values a realization of this in principle, though given persuasive in the positions of racism, perhaps not in practice, within a, either a multiracial state or a monoracial one, and these values can be erased on a universal ground or endorse a reason of, of interloyalty. 
Now, that's just a little bit of Martin Robinson Delaney, a man that's not really talked about during Black History Month. In my 39 years of living his life on this earth, he's not really talked about him during Black History Month. And I'm, I'm just starting to read this book now that was mentioned, the conditions and, and, um, and immigration and stuff like that. A book that Dr. Amos Wilson was reading out, and um, I just finally got my hands on it, so I'm just kind of geeked up to read about it. You know what I'm saying? But we should follow this brother thing. Hey, subscribe to the channel. Much love to this ancestor. And keep on pushing. That's what we do on Black History. Peace.